Hi there and welcome to the first official installment of the Siege Running Podcast. I kind of delved into podcasts a little bit earlier with VO2 Max Productions on the website, but I, thanks to all the Patreon support, all the views, uh, just trying to get into different forms of media basically, uh, I was able to purchase this audio equipment and devote the time and energy hopefully to what will be a growing podcast. Uh, I envision the Sage Running podcast. The theme of Sage Running is all about athlete empowerment uh, when Sandy and I founded the, the business and it's through coaching plans, it's through blog posts, it's through sharing these different forms of media and I figure with, with the YouTube channel here, vo 2 Max Productions, uh, you could also watch these podcasts, by the way, online. If you're not watching the video here on YouTube, these could be long form types of training talks where you could tune in, watch the video on YouTube, but also take the audio with you and take it out on a run or when you're commuting to work or road trip or something like that. And they're not going to be super long, uh, but I do envision it being more long form training talks. We could talk about nutrition, we could talk about race strategy, we could talk about any surface, any distance from racing the 5k or mile on a track to running a road or uh, half marathon on the roads, marathon on the roads, to ultra distance mountain racing, sky running events, 100 miles on a trail, uh, things like that, uh, things that I have experience in at least. And we could, you know, we could talk about <laughs> beverages, we could talk about beer, got my every beer out. Um, but yeah, this is just the introduction to the podcast. I'm still trying to figure things out, still trying to streamline things. Obviously, I'm a total noob at this, so feel free for uh, your constructive criticisms. But in this first episode, uh, since I don't have a guest on the show or anything, I do uh, want to talk a little bit about UTMB that just went down in the past 24 hours. Very exciting race, uh, as well as maybe some diet nutrition things in the news that I saw on social media today, uh, as well as my Run Rabbit Run 100 preparations, because that's going to be my next uh, key focus race. I actually have a race tomorrow on the bike. I'm going to do an 83 mile, 85 mile bike race. Well, it's a Grand Fondo, so it's really informal uh, in Golden, Colorado. And they measure out these uphill segments and add your time up that way. So you don't have to push for the whole 83 miles. Um, and yeah, I, I haven't ridden my bike for weeks and <laughs> I've never gone over 60 miles. I usually ride my bike like 15 or 20 miles, this little cross training. So it'll be interesting. Uh, hopefully nothing, I won't crash and hurt myself or die. Um, but uh, yeah, that's coming up. Um, so we'll get into UTMB discussion uh, first to start off. UTMB just happened, super exciting race, super something I'm passionate about just because it's probably the biggest 100 mile race you could do in Europe and it's very exciting. The whole town of Chamonix is like a endurance endurance uh, capital basically with people are parachuting and squirrel dive suit jumping and rock climbing, mountaineering, running, cycling, all these extreme endurance and extreme sport events uh, kind of captivates the, the culture of Chamonix. So really cool place to be and to be around the race atmosphere uh, for UTMB, the UTMB series of races is a really special unique type of experience and something that I really enjoyed last year. Uh, so the, the race is near and dear to my heart um, and it's a big race. There's I think over 2,000 runners this year just in UTMB alone, uh, which is kind of the big focus event. And a lot of people ask me, well, why don't you go back and try to race UTMB this year? And the answer to that is I wanted to, I just didn't have the points to qualify. I couldn't get in uh, to UTMB. They changed the point structure. I hadn't run a gnarly 100K recently, so I, I even after Western States, I didn't have the points to get into UTMB. So I, I did really, really want to do it. Uh, and so I had registered for CCC, the 100K version, but after Western States, I was just so disappointed uh, that, you know, I didn't want to go all the way to Chamonix just to run 100K. I wanted to do UTMB, I wanted to do the 100 miler. So 
that was kind of the, the impetus behind, well, pulling out of CCC, because I wanted to redeem myself at 100 miles. I'm like, what 100 miler could I do, uh, you know, in the time frame that I wanted? And I thought September was a better time frame anyway to run rabbit run 100, and it's local out here in Colorado. Usually draws a pretty good field. Price purse is $12,000 to win. Uh, it's a nice high altitude mountain race. Um, totally different from Western states, so. You know, I, I want to try that, and hopefully next year I could go back uh, to UTMB and, and really try to compete, because I love to go back. I love to go to all these iconic races uh, and go against top competition on a course that's really beautiful and also really challenging. Uh, I mean, there's lots of races I want to repeat again. Western States, Comrades, uh, you name it. But this year, really exciting. Uh, three Americans on the men's side in the top six. Uh, so you got Tim Tollison, got third place. Zach Miller, or actually Dave Laney was fourth place. Zach Miller was sixth place. Uh, so three Americans in the top six. Pretty good American showing. Those guys all run for the Nike Trail team. Uh, and, you know, they're all, they're all proven competitors, but it was... Tollefson's and Miller's first 100 mile races, whereas Dave Laney had gotten third there last year. Uh, so super exciting race to see. I won't go into all the details because you can look it all up. Uh, I'm on far great coverage. I was following along, staying late up, late at night uh, last night, trying to follow the coverage. And basically, Zach Miller was in the lead most of the race. And I don't know exactly what the weather conditions were like over there, and I, I, again, I don't even know the second half of the course exactly because I never made it that far last year, but uh, it, the pace wasn't terribly suicidal and fast. It, it always is at the start a little bit, but Zach really didn't take the lead and open up a gap until about 15 miles in. Uh, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but it was before Les Contamines, uh, which is around 18 miles or so. and. It wasn't a crazy course record pace. It was it was a little slower than than the lead pack that rolled through there last year. And I was looking at my old Strava splits to confirm that. Um, and we had a we had a good pack through there last year. You know, Luis Alberto, Miguel Heras, Xavier, um, Tofo were all up there. Uh, a couple other guys even. Uh, but this year, Zach was all by himself. He was all by himself. He had a five ten minute gap, and it was a fifteen minute gap uh, around halfway. He's always having a 15, 20 minute gap even after after Cormier, uh, over 80K into the race, um, over the 50 mile mark. Um, so, but it wasn't it wasn't course record pace, and I don't know, it, I know it was warmer temperatures. So he wasn't, what I'm, I guess is what I'm saying is, people compared it to Jim Walmsley, you know, taking the lead at, at Western States this year. I said, well, it wasn't quite as crazy as that because it wasn't. Uh, he wasn't way, 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 way under course record pace, and they have changed the course slightly at UTMB. But he was slower than than last year's pace at UTMB, and I believe the course was the same conditions. I think the footing was pretty good. It might have been a little bit warmer this year. It was fairly warm last year, but the heat doesn't really affect the runners as much until the next morning when you're trying to finish that last 20 miles or so, and the sun comes up, and then uh, you're fried and dehydrated and things like that. So. It was interesting to see the commentary on that, and you know, when you risk to try to win, and I'll give Zach a lot of kudos and credit for doing this, he ran to win. You know, he didn't want to race for second place. He didn't want to race just to finish. I'm sure those were all goals, uh, and he finished really strong, but he was trying to win the thing. And when you try to win a big stage race, um, you're exposing yourself, I think, a little bit to, to some criticisms and some what-ifs and a lot of speculation after the race, but that's the benefit of hindsight. See, he was running his own race, he was running in the lead like he likes to run in the lead, but I don't think he was running a terribly reckless, suicidal pace. Uh, I think he just happened to run a little bit harder than he was trained to run, and because of that, he kind of bonked a little harder than he probably should have. Now, I don't like playing the coulda, shoulda, woulda games, because it's like looking at my Western states. I could be like, well, if I went out 15 or 20 minutes slower at Forest Hill, and I was a little behind course record pace, and I was with the guy who won, Andrew Miller, would I have done better at Western states? And you could speculate a lot and be like, well, yeah you probably would have finished in a better place, maybe finished faster, even though you gave up 20 minutes uh, in pace because you wouldn't have 
had stomach issues as early or you wouldn't have bonked as hard or something like that but it's still speculation because I still could have had stomach issues uh, I could say well maybe I was less likely to have stomach issues if I wasn't at such a high heart rate um, but I still probably would have made the same dehydration the same hydration mistakes uh, and getting dehydrated and not taking in enough salt and I, you know, my legs would have been more tired because I would have been running longer maybe through the Cal Street section after Forest Hill. And so you can't say like, well, well, if I just went out slower, I, I would have done well. And you just also can't say, well, oh, if Zach Miller just went out a little bit ahead of Tim Tollefson and back with the guys who won or the guys who placed top three, he would have for sure won. Maybe his chances were higher that he would have held a more consistent pace but mentally, it might have been a different game for him because he's not running off the front. Uh, so, you know, again, it's a lot of speculation. I don't like it when people criticize uh, runners that, that lay it all on the line and go for it because it takes a lot of guts and perseverance to do that. And you're risking, I think you are risking blowing up uh, and fading a lot harder because of the exponential component in these longer races and obviously there's a lot of variables at play uh, both mentally and physically in such a long race but you know kudos and credit for Zach Miller for laying it on the line uh, kudos to Ludwig who actually actually I said his name wrong maybe uh, he's a Hoka compressed sport teammate who actually won the race I didn't even know uh, Ludo um, I didn't even know who he was exactly. I know Iron Far previewed him, but he ran a very consistent pace and ended up winning. I know my other uh, French Hoka teammate, Julien Chaurier, uh, was also up there and and risked a lot taking the lead after Zach faded a little bit and he faded a bit more as well. But it, you know, it takes a lot of guts to do that kind of thing. And uh, I give those guys a lot of credit. Whereas the people that maybe pace themselves better maybe we're able to get more out of themselves. Uh, maybe they held a more consistent pace and therefore they ran smarter, so to speak, and placed well. But, uh, you know, again, to say one strategy is necessarily better than the other, uh, I think is a little bit of baloney. Now, obviously, if Zach had gone out totally at, at course, you know, way under course record pace and was way, way ahead, after 50k and then you know had a spectacular bonk and and walked it in uh then people would say well that was maybe not a good idea but what i'm saying is he he didn't do something terribly reckless he was it is hard to take the lead and open up a gap like that in your first hundred and he probably knew it was a risk but he was going for a win and that takes a lot of courage uh the women's winner caroline uh, basically ran away with it so she actually held on to her early lead and I think she was actually pretty close uh, to course record pace uh, you know the course record women's course record at UTMB is amazing it's 22 hours I think 2237 something 2240 uh, so you know Rory Bazio ran that <laughs> amazing time and could run away from the field and and win so uh, you know, kudos to the, the champions uh, of UTMB, kudos to all the finishers and all the participants, just going there, it's a huge honor, just trying to get around the mountain, running all night, uh, I definitely, you know, it's something I want to experience, something that I've, I've never done, and again, I don't know the second half of the course, so I'm not claiming to be a, a course expert or an expert on finishing 100 milers at all, um, my record's pretty shoddy at, at racing and, and training for 100 milers, so... Uh, take take my advice with a grain of salt, pun intended. So, you know, we could transition into that UTMB recap, talk about a little bit about my own training, and then some basic nutrition things and social media to close out this first podcast. But basically, you know, with my 11th place at Western States and my spectacular bonk there, I'm definitely not in a position to say, oh, this is how you race 100 milers, this is how you train for 100 milers, this is what you should eat and drink over 100, miler, or over 100 miles. Because, uh, you know, it, it does depend a little bit on the individual. It does depend on your history and running. It depends on the course profile. It depends on the weather conditions. So there's a lot of variables at play, basically. Sorry, I was taking a sip of beer there for my podcast listeners. Don't mean to pause too much there, but... We'll try to get into the the my training, I guess, for Run Rabbit Run, which is coming up in three weeks, 
and I haven't even looked at the course yet. I need to go out there to Steamboat Springs since it is local. Probably be a good idea to do that and uh, see what I have to run in the dark because it's going to be another race where I'm going to have to run all night and it's going to be cold probably and yeah it's, it's <laughs> it concerns me a little bit. But I think, you know, from what I've learned at, at Western States, from what I've learned at watching races like UTMB is it's probably better off to be pretty conservative early on and then try to roll in the second half and really try to focus on finishing strong rather than not bonking or, or you know, imploding and, and having to walk it in because you're just going to get mowed down if you're walking a lot in the second half, especially with all these strong runners behind you who may or may not have paced themselves better or at least paced themselves better relative to their ability and their strengths and weaknesses and that goes into looking at the course profile as well I think strategically you could look and say hey there's a big climb at mile 70 I'm a good climber this is where I could make up some ground or you know if you like the downhills you could say well you know UTMB is a downhill finish I know if I'm neck and neck with someone in the last 10k I could fly down that hill to Chamonix and and pass people um, and a lot of times it does come down to very small margins uh, especially with second third fourth fifth place uh, amazingly at UTMB though the spread between first and second is relatively large and even the spread at, at uh, Western States is relatively large uh, whereas maybe between places fifth to seventh and eighth sometimes it's it's a closer spread and people are finishing within a couple minutes of each other so that's always interesting to see as well but yeah with run rabbit run uh again i'm i'm pretty scared uh i just don't want to i want to be able to finish strong that's the goal uh first goal is always just to finish but then also to try to place well and 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 run a good time and you could compare times to rob Carr, you could compare times to jason schlarb on that type of course uh, so that that kind of excites me as well but it might depend on weather conditions a little bit and strategy I know uh, Alex Nichols is doing his first hundred at least he's signed up for it right now so he's gonna be tough he just came off winning the Pikes Peak Marathon and he's been very experienced in high alpine environments I mean he's done film work with Anton Kropichka he's, he was teammates with Anton Kropichka in college and cross country so he knows what goes into racing uh, these high altitude 100 milers like Leadville and uh, these types of races so uh, that'll be interesting to see and there, there'll be a lot of tough guys for sure with that much prize money on the line but my main thing is surviving out there you know not falling and getting stitches not uh, totally bonking not getting massively dehydrated not having stomach issues and throwing up and not having my quads or muscles totally blow out and have amazing muscle cramps or, or weakness like that so you know it's a lot of variables at bay and I think with the longer races they're not necessarily harder you know you could run a, a 5k on the track and it's it's super hard you could run 100 miles in the mountains and it's gonna be hard and the 100 miler is definitely really drawn out and and there's a lot of variables that could go really wrong whereas the 5k on the track is gonna be a lot more controlled but in terms of what event is harder I don't think you could logically say well just because an event is longer it, you know it's harder than, than all 50 milers would be harder than all the 50 K's and it wouldn't matter what the elevation profile is so um, it's gonna be hard though it's uh, I think with hundred milers the big thing is just surviving just surviving the elements surviving the night surviving moving your body consistently a really long distance and a lot of vertical displacement probably you know not falling being able to manage your uh, caloric intake and hydration and mentally just breaking it down and saying hey I have to spend all day and probably all night out here in the woods or the mountains or wherever you are um, moving and not having any major low points totally derail your whole plan now that that does happen obviously um, but it is more about being consistent rather than actually racing super super hard at a, at a high heart rate and breathing hard and, and having that burning in your legs early on and then just totally losing it and having to walk and having to throw up and drop the pace and you know sit down at aid stations and so I did you know learn that from western states and uh, hopefully I could apply it to to run rabbit just trying to be patient in training 
did a 30 mile long run yesterday, ran 120 miles last week, which is a lot for me, mostly trail miles with close to 19,000 feet of climbing. Uh, but mainly focusing on just being consistent, getting the long runs in up high, doing some 14ers, uh, doing some power hiking even, and just trying to nail that nutrition and hydration component, uh, as well as you know getting my Nathan gear ready, making sure I have all my jackets that I might need because it's going to be cold at night in September at 10,000 feet. Maybe, maybe it'll be hot. I don't know, uh, but. Yeah, that's, it's uh, nerve-wracking, but also uh, exciting to be in that position to be able to go into this adventure. So I am looking forward to that, and hopefully I could even run, well, I could run the last 50 miles a lot more than I ran at Western States. Because I will tell you, walking most of the last 30 miles on buttery smooth downhill single track and getting past is not very fun, as you throw up. <laughs> um, and that was basically my Western States experience. So... To wrap up this podcast, uh, we'll go into one more little thing with, with diet and nutrition uh, and kind of a personal philosophy, I guess. But basically, I, I just posted on my YouTube channel uh, what I ate in a day, and it was a, a day last week, an average training day. And you could check that video out on YouTube if you're uh, following the podcast here. It's just posted it uh, yesterday night. And then I was also on social media this morning, and... I saw something that disturbed me a little bit, and again, I know this is really controversial, I'm not supposed to talk about diet, politics, religion, sex, things like that, but I'm going to talk about in a certain company, well, we'll just say Epic Food Bars, I'm not sure if they took down their blog post, but this is a company post, but some athlete that had been, that was happy about the post, and other people I know, they sponsored some ultra runners, had uh, posted a link to this post, blog posts on the company website, Epic Bars. They make all sorts of meat, animal product types of bars. I saw like a jar of duck fat. There was something with liver in it. Uh, You know, that's fine. Uh, But the title of the post was, and I better down uh, look at this real quick. The title of the post, and I don't know if he changed it or not, because he probably should have changed it. It's a little... uh, it's just, it's, it's bullshit marketing, I guess. And that's, that's probably what uh, bothers me the most. Is that, you know, people could write anything they want on the internet. And I could say anything I want on these podcasts, for example, or in YouTube videos. And, you know, it may or may not be right, but at least try to defend things with science. And I don't like things that are mis- mis- misinformation, basically, that's kind of presented as fact. That's, uh, that's uh, you know comes off as something that that I think is totally wrong, at least in my opinion. So this is my opinion. Um, So the title of the blog was Meat Consumption Must Be Doubled to Reduce Climate Change. Let's think about that for a minute. Meat consumption must be doubled to reduce climate change. And it's by the the co-founder of Epic Bars, Taylor Collins. Uh, You know, he's citing a lot of he cites the TED Talk from Alan Savory, the Savory Institute, and that's a hotly debated presentation. So Alan Savory is also hotly debated, especially within the plant-based communities, but also with environmental scientists and uh, even the you know U.S. agriculture disputes a lot of what he claims as helping the environment. And basically, it's uh, you know he's he's saying the more cattle, livestock. Free pasture grazing uh, is actually going to help the environment through carbon sequestration uh, and you know reduce get us back to, to better greenhouse emissions levels and basically help the environment. So, but that's fine, except it well it's not fine in my book. But the title of the blog is "Meat Consumption Must Be Doubled to Reduce Climate Change." Meat consumption doubled. Now that that see that just doesn't make sense. Uh, and especially if you look at, at a lot of first world countries, if you look at America, um, we're pretty high, you know, dairy and meat consumption, uh, especially with, with middle class, upper middle class, uh, actually all classes in the U.S. There's a lot of, of consumption. Now, if everyone doubled their meat consumption, 
Uh, but and then also everyone had to eat pasture raised meat. There just wouldn't be enough land and enough resources to really go around. And if you look at it at a global scale, the world scale, if everyone was eating meat and animal products on a daily basis, there wouldn't be enough energy to go around in my opinion. Uh, and then if they doubled their consumption, it would just be totally ridiculous. Uh, you can't just... You, I, I don't think you could say that. So that really grinds my gears. Uh, again, I'm getting probably off topic and maybe alienating some of the podcast viewers here. But I do, you know, obviously being a, a fairly plant-based athlete, nearly vegan, ovo-lacto-vegetarian my whole life, uh, more vegan plant-based in the last year, not quite 100%. I do have honey sometimes. Sometimes I sneak in a, a little dairy or eggs occasionally especially when I travel but for the most part I'm I'm eating a very plant-based diet and part of a big part of that is because of environmental concerns and again I don't claim to be a saint environmental wise I mean I fly on international flights plane flights are, are horrible I don't have an electric car I do have an old manual transmission car but I'm not you know I don't I could cycle to a lot of places in Boulder and I don't. So, you know, I'm not claiming to be to be perfect or to be this major environmentalist. It's just it grinds my gears when I see information like this being presented by a, a company that that sponsors ultra runners and that, you know, tries to portray this this idea that, you know, we need to consume more and I get it cuz they're obviously very biased. I'm very biased. But they're obviously very biased. This is their business. This is a business model. They sell meat bars. Of course, they're going to want to enforce and tell you that you know eating meat's good for the environment. It's all part of their environmental thing. And they'll be like, well, it's you know all the studies that show uh, methane emissions from cows and the you know factory farming and you know that's evil. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of factory farming is a main source of pollution and is a main source of food and you know pasture land is very uh very limited really and to have more cattle tramping around on it uh is probably not going to be a good thing for the environment when we could grow a lot of crops and plant-based sources on this land instead and the way we develop land uh you know is, is a real touchy subject but it's you know this type of misinformation in my opinion that's uh, kind of disturbing and I, you know, I just want to separate fact from, from fiction. And again, on my Facebook post, I posted about this, that the human mind is amazing at rationalizing things. You know, we could, we could rationalize anything we want to believe and then convince ourselves that it's, it's the right way and it's the only way. And, you know, th that kind of thing is dangerous, I think. And, you know, I realize I'm biased in saying that myself because obviously being plant-based and, and arguing against this is, is a stance, but, you know, people think out there's these conspiracies out there with, with climate change and things like that, and the fact of the matter is, why wouldn't you want to try to do something that's going to help the environment? You know, humans as a species, we're supposed to be smart, but we're the only species that's systematically destroying the environment, where these other animals who are our friends are trying to coexist and, uh, not destroy the world for, for every living creature and everyone else on in different countries. Uh, so just kind of some some uh, thinking points there, and I, I realize I went way off topic. I'm going to end this podcast before I, uh, you know, totally alienate all my viewers, but that is something that I'm passionate about, something that I'm going to open up on uh, with this podcast. And, you know, I think in the future we could do some question uh, Q&A, maybe live Q&A, uh, that we could record for the podcast as well as on the YouTube uh, videos here and uh, really do appreciate your feedback and comments go ahead and shoot some comments below or uh, if you you know found this on the on the podcast uh, you, just, you know share it rate it I don't, I don't even know how it works yet but uh, I definitely do want to keep doing this thank you to the patreon viewers and patreon supporters on YouTube for allowing me to get this audio equipment and devote more time and energy to these types of things. I hope you found this kind of useful, or at least uh, something that, that uh, could be helpful. Uh, if not, it made you maybe angry with the, the diet talk and, and things like that, and you could argue with me on that. Uh, I'm open to comments. Thank you so much for all the support. Uh, it's been a really amazing journey. Really look forward to uh, sharing more of my training and things like that with you guys, as well as doing extended training talks and some interviews, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. 
and stay tuned for more Sage Running Podcasts. I wish to stay.